last night, man. It feels like August in the, in the state of Florida to me. Yeah. All over. <laughs> You know when you're ready, Andy, okay? Okay, all right, sorry. <laughs> okay, anyway, we're going to start with a word of prayer this morning. There's several new folk, uh, folks on our prayer list. Uh, please uh, pray for Danielle Garcia. Uh, she's not on your prayer list, but uh, she went home sick from work, uh, and they're concerned about her having maybe COVID. So please pray for her, a young lady. And then uh, Harriet Booth is, is on our prayer list this week. Harriet's a former... A member, they moved to Montana, but she had a heart attack uh, a few days ago. So please remember her in prayer. I think she's home now uh, and doing feeling a little better. And many others there that you want need to lift up to the Lord to the Lord in prayer today. So let's uh, let's begin our service by talking to the Father this morning. Anybody been talking to God this week? Mm -hmm. and, and focusing on the Father. I hope that uh, uh, I've tried doing that out of the Psalms. If you just read some of the Psalms and the way David prays, uh, a lot of times he starts off with just. You know, praising God and telling you know, God, you know, exalting God in God's name. So let's do that this morning. Father, what a privilege it is to come to the house of God today. And Lord, thank you for setting up this this thing we call the church, Lord. And we praise you for that. And uh, Lord, uh, you're an awesome God, a wonderful God to us. And we, uh, we can't exalt your name enough, Lord. You're our Redeemer, our Savior. Uh, Lord, you're our high tower. You're our, our rock of uh, our strength. God, you're the one who sustains us and it saves us, and we praise you for that. And Lord, today we come in the name of Jesus, your dear Son, who went to Calvary for us, who paid the price, the sacrifice of his own life, and his own blood, so that we could be saved. And we come to you also in the Holy Spirit, leading us, Lord, as we pray today, that, uh, Lord, we can uh, honor you and worship today in spirit and in truth. And Father, that's the way we want to come before you. So please forgive us of our sins. Cleanse us of anything right now that would hinder our worship today and make us clean and whole before you. And then, Lord, speak to our hearts today, we ask, that you would use the message and the music, Lord, and the worship to, to go deep down into our soul this morning. And Father, we want you to get honor and glory from this service. And then, Lord, we bring our requests for healing for these we just mentioned, that, uh, for Harriet, who uh, had a recent heart attack, Lord, we pray for her. For complete healing. We pray for Danielle for healing for her body as well. Lord, take away the fever she has, Lord, we pray. And Lord, be with Leanne as she recovers. And, and Gloria O'Laker and Zachary McBroom and, and be with Mary at Peta Home. Lord, she's here this morning, but, but some days it's hard for her to come. So we just pray for her and lift her up to you. And bless us and, and speak to our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to start off with a special this morning. So Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This uh, this morning's message, uh, I don't want to give it all away, but it's uh, it's talking about serving God, serving God. Yeah. And, so the, right. I, and I knew that uh, a month ago or so, and so I wanted to uh, bring a song this morning for us that, that focuses on that. It's an example out of the book of Job, the story of Job. Mm -hmm. As the sun rose that morning on the day of Job's trials, he rose up to serve God as any other day. Bound and determined to live in God's favor, nothing could stand in his way. Then the messengers came one by one of their stories. Just a few moments, Job lost all he had. From his great wealth and riches to the hem of his body, even his children were dead. And he said, The Lord giveth me. Take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Then his wife came before him to voice her opinions. She said, you should end it. Just curse God and die. But Job arose from the ashes and he looked for the heavens. And he put much crack the tears from his eyes. And he said, The Lord giveth me, take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've served him before and I'll serve him today. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When troubles come suddenly, blessed be the day. When storm clouds grow violently, blessed be the day. And when Satan comes oppressing me, blessed be the day. I'll still serve God faithfully, blessed be the day.
some announcements to make, then we'll receive our offering this morning, and uh, big announcement, uh, Wednesday night we voted as a church to bring on Brother Joshua Ellard as our new youth pastor, and uh, I'm excited about that. Now, the Ellards are all, they're on a little vacation this weekend, so they won't be here today, but uh, I'm sure they'll be back next week and joining the church uh, next week, and uh, they're officially going to start, uh, he is on the uh, beginning of uh, September, but in the meanwhile, we'll be meeting with him and figuring out some things that we want to uh, see God do and, uh, and how he's going to work. So pray for uh, Brother Josh Ellard. His wife's name is Carissa, and they have two boys, uh, Bryce and Avery. So Bryce is the older of the two, and Bryce and Avery. So y'all get to know that family. They're a wonderful, wonderful family, and that's Nancy Preston's son. So she's one of our members, and so we praise the Lord for that. Uh, tonight, 6 uh, p.m., we're going we're gonna to go ahead and do another Foundations video with uh, uh, Dr. Ken Ham. We did that last Sunday night, and uh, hopefully everyone enjoyed that. And uh, so we're going to pick out one of those, uh, another one of his, uh, uh, his series. He's got, there's about, I don't know, eight videos or so in that series. So uh, we'll watch some of that tonight. Okay, so be here with us for that. And then uh, September, excuse me, Sunday, August the 30th, we've got evangelist and singer Alan Harris will be here with us, and his wife Angie, I'm sure, will be traveling with him. And so we want you to come, and uh, both morning services, he'll be singing the 9 o'clock and the 1030, and uh, he might just uh, do, do different songs in each service, so you might want to stick around and, and be part of uh, both services. I'll, I'll talk to him about that, if you and would, okay? Preaching. Huh? And he'll yeah. be preaching. Yeah, he'll be preaching and singing, so... Uh, you come for that. We have some other announcements in the bulletin there, too. Uh, a baby bottle campaign we're going to be doing for the 
Choices Pregnancy Care Program here in Lake Wales, and this is an alternative to abortion, so we, we want to support that. Amen. You know, I think abortion is a, sin, a deep, dastardly sin Amen. upon our nation. It's a plague upon our nation, and uh, we need to give alternatives to these uh, young girls and, and ladies who uh, have unplanned pregnancies and so forth, and there are alternatives, of course. So, uh, and, and this will be, uh, they pass out baby bottles, and then you fill them up with your change, your dollar bills, or $100 bills or checks or whatever you want to put in there uh, to support the, uh, uh, the pregnancy centers. So that will start in September. And then also our uh, youth camp, or excuse me, our adult camp for the young youth, right? Those that feel young. Uh, it's going to be in October as well, the uh, 18th through the 23rd. Cost is $200 per person. And someone asked me the other day, when can we start giving our deposit? And I held out my hand and said, right now. <laughs> So get your deposit in. Uh, Candy will take that yeah. from you. Don't give it to me. I'll lose it. So, amen. So, yeah. uh, <coughs> Lloyd never got back with me when, so we could just start because yeah. I could just put it in the bank. Exactly. Amen. All right. So uh, let's be here for that. All right. Let's uh, take up our offering this morning. Uh, pray for these uh, on our prayer list, of course. Also, you know, a good idea is to pray for those who uh, have birthdays in the month and those who have anniversaries, like Horace and Lois Howe uh, have an anniversary later this month. So, uh, remember those folks in prayer. All right. John, you want to pray for us, sir? Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house today, Lord. It's so good. You are so good to us, Lord. We yes. just thank you so much for that. Lord, we, we thank you for the services already, Lord. We pray for the service still to come. Lord, we just pray for this offering. May it be an honor and glorifying your presence to you, Lord. May, may this church continue to be blessed with our tithes and offering, Lord. We just love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, pray. Amen. Amen.
Mike's gone. Okay. Who would help you? Pass out something. Thank you, Carrie. I hope you did enjoy that, uh, that song. That was written by a, a man named uh, Ron Hamilton, who uh, he was a one-eyed singer. Yep. Yeah, he had a patch, always wore a patch on his, on one of his eyes, and he, he developed a uh, ch children's curriculum called Patch the Pirate, yep. and uh, did that for many years, and uh, was very popular there. So, uh, uh, Ron Hamilton, all right. Well, uh, let's talk about serving God this morning, amen? We're talking about, been talking about it being established in the faith. By the way, we're going to be in John chapter 13, the Gospel of John chapter 13. Find your place there. And I want to welcome everybody to our early morning service. I'm so glad you could be here. Uh, you, you guys are the early birds, amen? And, and then we got the latecomers that will be here a little bit later, okay? If, if they struggle, struggle in, you know, straggle in sometimes. Uh, and... Uh, but uh, we're continuing in, our, in this series called Established that we started a few weeks ago. We're talking about what it means to have a relationship with God, what it means to build this close relationship and, and make it better. And, and uh, not just knowing things about God, but really, really knowing God, getting to know Him personally. And each week we've been looking at uh, different things, different ways that we can be established in the faith. And we take that word established, it's uh, out of Colossians chapter uh, uh, chapter 2 there. And uh, the word established, one of the, one of the definitions in the dictionary is growing and flourishing successfully. How many of you would like to, to be able to say that about your Christian life, that it's growing and flourishing successfully? Amen? I think we all would like to be there. Here's the verse that we've been using as our kind of our foundation of this whole message series. It's Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7. It says, uh, read it with me. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Okay, so we want to be built, uh, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. And when we do that, we can begin to, to uh, abound in our lives and flourish and grow, as we said, successfully. So here's where we're at in the series of six weeks. And by the way, I think it's going by pretty fast. I uh, uh, hope you do. And uh, so we started with knowing God, and then talked about hearing from God, and then last week we talked about talking uh, with God and communicating with the Lord in our prayer life, and uh, uh, I hope God spoke to your heart about that as he did mine. And then this week we're, uh, we're going to talk about serving God, and then we'll follow up that with walking with God and sharing God with others, all right? So that's where we're headed. Uh, let's start with a story this morning. Anybody like stories? Okay. Well, I'll tell you a story about a... It goes back, all the way back to the 1920s, there was a young Michigan farmer. He was a teenager at the time. He was expected to take over his family's farm uh, from his uh, parents, but, he, it, but instead he really loved uh, building things and engineering things. So in 1927, he developed a new kind of furniture. Back then, you know, furniture just kind of sat there. It, it, it didn't do anything. It just, have you ever seen the, the furniture like from the 1800s and things, all those straight back chairs and you know, just uncomfortable looking. I mean, you know, what do you do with that? You know, there's just so much you can do. And so he, he began to develop this, this chair that would actually move and, uh, and, and lean back when you sat in it if you wanted to. And later on, he developed a lever that would hold. It would even bring up a footrest, and you could, you could uh, actually kind of really recline into that chair. And, and so he and his cousin, they began going around to furniture stores and showing this new invention of his uh, and, and asking him would you like to sell this and of course the furniture people said well sure we, we want to make how many can you make and and so they would order stuff so people fell in love with this brand new technology from this self-taught engineer they began selling his product they began to grow and grow and grow and he and his cousin ran the business for years but in the 1970s this business went public and the founder, of course, it was such a huge, huge business at that time, the founder became extremely wealthy. And years before that, they had run a naming contest, and the winner was, you probably know, Lazy Boy. Lazy Boy. And look what it says under that. It's one of their new slogans, right? Live life comfortably. 
Boy, what a great slogan. I like that. You know, live life comfortably, right? Just be comfortable. Be, be, be satisfied, you know? Come home at the end of a work day and plug, uh, pluck yourself down in that lazy boy chair and don't move until it's bedtime, right? That's, uh, you know, the wife, bring me, bring me something to drink. Bring me something to eat. You know, that's, that's kind of the, the, the culture we kind of developed back in the 50s and 60s, it seemed like at times, okay? Well, the winner of the name, they, they, they did a contest, naming contest. The winner was Lazy Boy, but the, uh, let me give you some of the other finalist names. I kind of like these. Uh, another one was the Sit and Snooze. <laughs> sit and Snooze. I kind of like that, right? Uh, the other one was called the Slack Back. <laughs> so they go down and buy you a Slack Back, you know, at the, at the furniture store. The other one was called the Comfort Carrier. So these are some of the names that uh, they came up with and for this naming contest. They chose the name Lazy Boy. I, I, I realize it doesn't have a Y on there. It finally dawned on me as I looked at that logo once again, but just Lazy Boy. And, and this young farmer turned into deer, his name was Edwin Shoemaker. And whenever he would be asked about his company years later, uh, he would say, well, I guess we did pretty good. Hmm. And in 1998, at the age of 90, Edward the Shoemaker was still working and helping run the company. He went out with his friends near his winter home in Arizona, and they had dinner together, and they were just out having a good time with friends and, and so forth. He came home that night. He sat down in his lazy boy recliner, leaned back, and passed away. That's kind of ironic, maybe poetic, that he literally reclines in his lazy boy and dies, right? Now that's kind of part of what we call the American dream, you know? Uh, he did it. He, he, he went from just being a farm boy to being a wealthy multimillionaire. He had everything he wanted, it seemed, you know, in life. He had all the success, and he went out just seemingly peacefully, having this huge impact on the world by, by his invention that he had done. But here's the thing. What we're about to look at in today's passage of Scripture is going to take the American dream and flip it all upside down. Mm -hmm. All right? <laughs> if we do that? Well, look at with me. We'll be in verse 1 there in just a moment. You see, back in Jesus' day, they didn't have an, the American dream because, <laughs> frankly, they didn't have America yet, right? They had what they called the Roman dream, I guess, if you had to give it a name. <laughs> and, and the Roman dream is, is, is kind of like the American dream and that, uh, uh, not, not a whole lot's changed in 2,000 years. Back in the Roman time period, you see, they had a very structured uh, class system that had developed, and, and the goal was moving further and further up the ladder and getting moving from one class to another, uh, to another, bettering yourself, bettering your family, bettering, you know, the next generation in your life, kind of like we've done in America in many ways. And, and at the very top of the ladder, of course, in the Roman uh, uh, structure, that system that they had, that, that Roman dream was uh, if you if you worked hard enough and, and you were in the right position, you might even become Caesar one day. You know, you might even become the, the king, right, of the empire and so forth. And so, uh, and, and then, so you had this top class of rulers, you know, of, of the country and of the of the empire. And then below them, you had the, the Senate. So those, there were 600 men that worked or that were elected or, or, or were given that position of being in the Senate class. And and they had lots of privileges and lots of wealth and money and, and things that were available to them that weren't available to others. And, and all those guys, whether they said it or not, they, they all secretly wanted to be Caesar, the next Caesar, you know. And, but it was really hard because that's just one guy. And you had to wait years for them to pass off the scene oftentimes. And below the, the Senate was what they called their, uh, they had a name for it, but I won't, the, the wealthy landowners of, of the Roman uh, system. And so you have these people with lots of land and lots of what? Lots of money, right? That, that, that were in that particular class. And, and these, and so all of these classes at the top, they had 100% of the power, you understand, right? In that culture. And, and that is where all the decisions, decisions were made. That's, that's the one, they're the ones who had all the authority in the Roman Empire. And of course, below that would be the common Roman citizen, and at the very, very bottom of the class uh, were the servants and the slaves. They were the lowest of the low. Now, at every single level of the class system, the goal was just to move up. If you were a slave, your goal was to somehow earn your freedom. 
and become a free man, they would call it. You know? Now they still worked, they still had to struggle, they still life was hard, but they were no longer the property of someone else. The free man's desire was to was to move up and, and, and get some land of his own, get a house of his own, get you know, get some property, get something that he could have for his own. So he would work hard to do that. He would try to move up. And then that that man would, would try to become a wealthy landowner, you know, acquire more land and move up in the system. Are you, are you following with me? You're tracking with me this morning, okay? I don't want to lose you. So no matter where you were, if you worked hard enough, you tried enough, you did enough, uh, put in enough effort, you might be able to work your way up and accomplish and be successful in your society. Now, in John chapter 13, Jesus is going to take this hierarchy that would have been impacting the community even around him in that day, because as you know, the land of Israel was under Roman uh, control when Jesus was here. And it would have been the way people thought and the kind of goals that they probably had. And he's going, to, he's going to flip that entire thing upside down, help us understand what life is truly about and where real happiness is found. Are you ready for that? <laughs> let's see. Oh, we'll flip that upside down. Okay, let's, let's put the lazy boy on its side here, okay? All right. The Roman Empire, we talked about that. And so let's look at John chapter 13, and let's begin there at verse number 1 after we pray. Father, bless the reading of your word now, and bless as we, as we move through this message, Lord. May its truths impact our hearts and lives. And Father, that we could learn this wonderful secrets of service that Jesus taught his disciples. Not just in this one passage, but over and over again. He taught those 12 men how to serve. And that service was to be their highest goal in their life. Not success, but service. Father, may we be impacted by that as we come to this thought of today of serving you and how you want us to serve you and, and what's going to please you in our service, Father. So help us to you know, understand it and apply it in the right way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look with me at verse 1, and here's what it says there in that opening verse. It says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. I just love that last phrase, he loved them unto the end. Did you get that? Jesus never gives up on you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> he loves you to the end. And by the way, later in this chapter, he's going to give a great discourse to his disciples before he goes to the cross. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you what? You have love one toward another. And so here he is. He's in the next 24 hours, of the context of verse 1 is, in, in the next 24 hours, Jesus is going to be betrayed by one of his 12 disciples. One of his closest companions, one of his closest friends is going to turn on him. You know his name is what? Judas. Judas. Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be put on trial. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified within the next day. And Jesus knows that is all going to happen. It's not a secret. He's been telling his disciples for, for months that's going to happen. And so the timing of this, what's going to take place here in this chapter, is really important. You have to understand, this is the last day Jesus is on the earth, and here is what he wants to show or teach by his actions to his disciples, right? You get that? Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of like the, the, the Braveheart speech moment, where, where he's going to, here's guys, here's what I want you to, to understand before I leave this place. In the next few chapters of John are full of that kind of information. He knows what's going to happen. He knows his time has come. And having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them to the end, knowing that in, for him this is the end in a sense, right? And notice verse 2 and 3. I don't think these verses are up there, but uh, we'll just put up the picture there. So here's where they are. They're in the upper room. Uh, Twelve disciples, Jesus. In verse 2 it says, And supper being ended, 
the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and that he was going to God, or went to God. Let's stop there for a moment. Did you notice it says, God, the Father, had given all things into his hand. Did you see that? All things. Everything is under the power of Jesus Christ today, believe it or not. Amen? It is. Including that entire hierarchy that we looked at from the servants all the way up to Caesar. See, Jesus understands that he's above all of that, and, and, and he has all authority, and he has all power. And even though the people at the time would have called Caesar the king of kings, Jesus, we know, is the true king of kings. He's the true Lord of lords. I'm talking about capital K, capital L. He's the king. He's the Lord. And so what does he do with his power? Look at verse 4 and 5. Let's see what he does. He's all powerful. He rises from supper. And he laid aside his garments and took a towel, girded himself, wrapped it around him. And after he had poured water into a basin, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel wherewith he was girded. Oh, what in the world is Jesus doing on his knees before his disciples down there like a lowly servant washing their feet. Doesn't he know? Yes, he does know who he is. But he also knows he wants to teach a lesson to his disciples of what they should be and ought to be. God, a culture says you're supposed to work your way up because if you get to the top, man, you can just chill out in that recliner chair you bought down at the, the lazy boy you got. Hey, that, that's it, right? Everybody is to serve you and and Jesus, you're at the top of the food chain here, but Jesus does something he did so radical. He does, it was so unexpected and so shocking that Jesus shook things up and, and Jesus gets up from the meal and he takes off his outer garment, his tunic, and he puts on a towel around his waist and he kneels down and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. I don't know what picture you may have in your mind of what God is like. Maybe you see God as some angry judge ready to send down a lightning bolt to tear up your world from time to time when you mess up, or maybe maybe you see God as, as an old man sitting in a recliner chair up in heaven, just kind of chilling out or whatever. But scripture says Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And if you want to know what God is like, then you look at Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. In this moment, Jesus takes on the form of a servant. Uh, wrapping a towel around his, his waist. He's, he's giving us an example, you see, of what it means to, uh, to serve. This is who he is. Jesus came to serve. Who did he come to serve? Well, that day in that room, there were 13 people, Jesus and the 12 disciples. And about those other men that were in that room. One of those disciples we just read about was named Judas. Did you know Jesus washed, washed the feet of the betrayer the night day or that same night that he was betrayed? He knew Jesus was, or Judas was going to do that, but he did it anyway. Sometimes people say, well, I don't want to serve with those people. You know, they, they're never, they're never going to come to church. They're never going to give anything back or whatever. Listen, it's not your decision to make who you serve. Amen. All right. Even if it, 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 everybody knows who Judas is, the one who betrayed Jesus, and he's about to betray him, and, and so he washes his feet. And, and also in that room, there was a guy named Peter, and in and, and these next 24 hours, guess what Peter's going to do? He's going to deny the Lord three times. He's going to, I don't even know that man, he's going to exclaim, and he's going to curse, and, 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 you know, just say, I don't, I don't know him. I'm not following him. I'm not his disciple. So he goes to the feet of his denier and he washes his feet. There's another guy in that room, John. His name was Thomas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thomas is a doubter. <laughs> you know, before the next few days, Thomas is going to be saying, I, you know, I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. I, you know, I wouldn't believe it unless I stuck my hand in his side and, you know, 
and, and saw the nail prints in his hand. I'm not going to believe it. Right. Doubt it. Mm -hmm. yep. Jesus was on his feet, excuse me, on his knees washing Thomas's feet just a few days before that happened. Jesus, you see, served those who didn't deserve it. That's right. Mm -hmm. Jesus serves those who rejected him. Those who would betray him, those who would deny him, those who would, who would doubt him, yet he humbles himself to serve. Oh, that's good. So, what was the big deal about washing feet anyway? You know, we don't think much about spending a lot of time washing our feet, do we? Okay. But in that society, you have to look back and understand where they came from. It was, it was a dirty, dusty, uh, nasty job of washing feet. Your feet. It was, it was considered a menial task. It was to, to be done by the humblest of servants. Think about it. They would have worn, of course, sandals back then. Many of the roads that they walked upon would be dirt roads. Not just dirt roads for people, dirt roads for, for animals to tread on as well. You know what animals leave behind when they walk down a road? <laughs> okay. I'm glad I got sandals on, so otherwise it's between my toes, right? <laughs> or whatever, but... Uh, there would have been all kinds of animal excrement and filth and sick all over the streets, and, and they would have uh, they would have picked that up, of course, on their feet. Ladies, have, can you walk with sandals and not get dirty if you're going through a dirty place? It's yeah, really hard, isn't it? It's going to get on you no matter what. And they were walking through town. They're going along these dusty roads of Palestine, and Jesus goes and he washes that off with a towel that he's wrapped around himself. Then he it, he takes all of this filth and junk from the from the feet of those guys, and he takes it and actually kind of wears it upon himself in a sense. His, his hands would have been dirty from doing this job. The towel would have been filthy, yet he chooses to clothe himself in that. And Jesus, you see, I believe he's given us a picture of the gospel in a sense. The gospel, of course, means what? Good news. And, and the gospel is that when you and I were covered in the filth because of our sin, because we were covered in all this gross, all this sick, Jesus came and he met us right where we were. He humbled himself. He knelt down. He took our filth on himself. He did that through the cross. Paid for your sin, your dirt. He took all the stuff and that we had picked up. He took it and he wore it. And in this moment, it's this beautiful picture that when you and I couldn't clean the filth of ourselves, God came to us and took it upon himself to wear it upon him. All oh, the gospel is a beautiful message we have. Amen. That's what make Chris, makes Christianity different from every other religion. Every other religion says, wash your own feet. You do a good job because you got to be pleasing to your God. Jesus says, come on, and I'll wash your feet for you. I'll make you clean all over. That's <laughs> what he's going to do. And so Christianity is not about cleaning ourselves up. It's, it's figuring out. It's not about working out on our own. It's about God meeting us where we are and allowing, us, allowing him to cleanse us from our sin. Now, go to verses 6 through 10 with me. We don't have a lot of time to spend on these verses, but uh, Jesus deals here with Peter's reluctance to have his feet washed. <laughs> oh, no, he's not going to have any of it, is he? Verse 6 says, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, uh, are you going to wash my feet? It's like, Lord, you don't want to do this. Now, maybe it's because he looked at his feet and they were really, really dirty. I don't know. No, no, you don't want to do this. Jesus said, answered and said in verse 7, What I do thou knowest not. Now, but thou shalt know hereafter. In other words, one day it will dawn on you, Peter, what's going on here, what I'm doing, why I'm doing it. And verse 8, now Peter, though still in his, his dumb, you know, uh, sometimes he, he, he stubborn. You, you know, Peter was kind of stubborn. He's like a lot of us, isn't he? Yeah, and he's just kind of stubborn, a little bit, yeah. And, and Peter said, thou shalt never wash my feet. I don't know about you, but it's... I think it would be a little scary to look Jesus in the face and tell him no, wouldn't you? <laughs> Knowing who he is. Uh, uh, now, 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 let me just say that I think I, I believe I know what, what Peter was thinking, in a sense. What he was thinking, you see, he's the one, he was thinking, Lord, this is no job for you. You're better than that. You're not just a menial servant, God. You are the king of kings. You're, in fact, 
He had just explained uh, in a few passages over, he had said, after all, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You should not be washing my feet. That's right. That's probably what he was thinking, so I, I understand that. But I love his reaction. I mean, how he flip-flops, right? Verse 9, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. <laughs> just give me a bath all over, Lord. That's, that's kind of what he, was, what he was saying. Jesus said in verse 10, He that is washed, he is not to, say, to wash his feet. But it's clean every whit, and you are all clean, but not all. Now, now that gets a little confusing in a sense, but I think Jesus is kind of moving from the physical to the spiritual, and we're back again, kind of in this passage a little bit, and and, and it kind of goes like this. Listen, once you get saved, once you once you come to know Christ as your personal Savior and, and your Lord, you're you're clean. You're clean in God's eyes. Your salvation is secure. Now, what happens, though, when I sin after I've gotten saved? Do I have to get saved again? No. Why? No, I, I can't get saved again. That would mean Jesus would have to go back to the cross and die again every time I sinned. And these people are bleeding, lose your salvation over every, everything that they do. You know, they, they don't understand the concept there. But when you sin, it's like your feet got dirty again, right? And, and, and your feet are dirty. And so what do you, you need a cleansing of your feet. I think of a verse in 1 John 1 9. It says, uh, uh, what does it say? We, we, confess our sins. we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us Amen. from all unrighteousness. That's not a salvation verse, that's a fellowship verse. Uh -huh. It's all about staying in fellowship with God. We have, we have sin in our life, we're not in fellowship with the Lord like we ought to be. And so we need to get that, we need that daily foot washing in a sense, or right. the cleansing of our spirit, okay? And I think that's what Jesus was talking about there. Go to verses 12 through 17, and we'll continue through this passage here for a moment and get to something else here, okay? Verse 12, uh, and, and by the way, he, he mentions there Judas in verse 11, for he knew who should betray him, therefore he said, you're not all clean. He knew that it was an unsaved man in that, in that building that day. Uh, and, and verse 12, so after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he saith unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord. And you say, Well, for so I am. Is he the Master and Lord? Yep. Is he your Master and Lord? Yep. Yes. Okay. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither is he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, verse 17, I love this verse, if ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Can I just say right now, Jesus is not instituting a new ordinance for the church here right. called foot washing. And some people practice that, but that's not what's going on here. Uh, but he's giving us an example of servanthood, of yes. how to serve in a sense, okay? And so, uh, and I love how much uh, detail is recorded here for us about this whole event. Uh, he's saying that, that really, here's where your Christian life begins. Now, yes, you got saved. Yes, you're, you begin hearing from God. Yes, you begin talking with God. You're established in those things. But now the next step for you is to begin to serve. Did you get that? To begin to what? To serve. serve. Amen. And any person who's ever walked this planet, here's wh where it begins. It begins, of course, first of all, by letting Jesus serve you. Mm -hmm. He served us when we went to the cross. Didn't he? Right. he gave his life for us. And it allows him, in Christian life, practically speaking, is learning to receive the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. But then the second part is learning to give it away to others in his name. We're to we serve the Lord on most occasions by serving others. That's right. And that's where the blessings come in our life. Verse 17, it says, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. As I was studying this, and I went back and looked at the words that are used uh, for the word servant and service and, and so forth in the scriptures, there was, there was a couple of things that kind of stood out, in, in my opinion, um, on that. And, uh, and so I just want to, there's two things here. Two, ser two service, uh, true service involves these two primary functions. The first one is the word service is often used in relationship to worship. We even do that now. What time is the 9 o'clock service? You're in a service right now. Okay? 
Okay, right? We're in a service, and this is a time for worship. And, and so service, uh, for instance, it would be used in the Old Testament uh, uh, of the, uh, the priest and the Levites who served in the temple. They were there to, to, to minister things and do things there and, and so forth. And, and so your service was an act of giving to God, back to God, because of his blessings upon you. And so worship is so important. Now, in the New Testament, the word worship uh, basically means to bow down before. It means to submit yourself to. It means to admit or acknowledge that there's one greater than you and to give him uh, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the worship that is due unto his name. It's really an attitude of our hearts, I believe. Let me share with you a couple of verses involved in worship, okay, that use involved the word service. Romans 12, 1, uh, uh, a yeah. great portion of scripture. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Service. Your reasonable service. Now, some translations have that last word as worship because it's, it has that connotation of worship. And so it's the idea of serving God, okay? Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, worship, what, what, other, what other part of worship is it that in that verse is that idea of a sacrifice? Mm -hmm. They use sacrifices as part of their worship. Yes. And so, uh, but, it's, but it's, our, it's our, can I tell you this? Service is going to be a sacrifice sometimes. If you're not really putting any effort into it, if you're not sacrificing your time or some energy or maybe some money, you're, you're probably not really serving, are you? Is that true? Okay. So, so God wants us to give him, give him our, our lives as a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. Here's another verse um, back in Deuteronomy chapter 10. Uh, now Israel, what doth the Lord require of thee? But to fear the Lord thy God and to walk in all of his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with, with what? All thy heart. With all thy heart and with all thy soul. That's worship. Amen. When we, when we serve God, that's what he's talking about there. Uh, also, and then here's another verse, uh, Joshua 24. You all know this one. It seems evil unto you to serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. By the way, you are serving someone or some something in your life. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe self, or you could be satanic, uh, you know, worshiper or something. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody hear one of those? Okay, I didn't think so. Uh, and, and you're going to serve somebody, right? Choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the gods of your fathers. Uh, uh, your God and Father served that were on the other side of the flood of the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And I, it's talking there, I think, about worship in the sense of we're going to follow God. We're going to worship God. He's, he's, our, he's our one and only. One more verse, Matthew 6, 24. Jesus mm -hmm. himself said, no man can serve what? Two masters. Two masters. For either you will hate the one and love the other. Or else you will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, somebody give me another word for mammon. Money. 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 Wealth. American dream. Mm. Mm, yeah. You can't, you can't serve God and, and, and money both. And we try hard to do that, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we? We think we can straddle that fence pretty well, right? He says we really can. So worship. Worship is part of our service. So should you show up at church on Sunday? Yes. 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 Why? Because you want to worship with other believers. All right. Number two, it involves what? Work. 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 <laughs> Believe it or not, service, serving God is going to involve some work. It's going to involve some, some ex expanding of your energy uh, in life. Titus 3 Verse 8 says, this is a faithful saying, and, and, uh, and all these things I will affirm, now affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. Works, that's uh, the way the Bible talks about works or working in the Bible. These are things are good and profitable unto men, he says. I love how Jesus connects those two, by the way, uh, together too. Uh, uh, these two things, loving God, you see, leads to serving God, right? Mm -hmm. And serving God usually means serving others by doing something, some action. And good works are the actions that we engage in response to our love for God. Jesus made that connection when he 
said the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. He says, and the second is like, just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He makes this connection. The way that we love an invisible God is by loving and serving our visible neighbors. Now, who's your neighbor right now? Oh, turn to the left, turn to the right, turn behind you or in front of you. There, there's a neighbor around you, okay, somewhere. Can you serve that person or those people in this room? Yes, the people in our church. Yeah, we're to serve one another, right? It's, it's one, of the, one of the things we're to do. Uh, we're to... We're to wash one another's feet in that, in that sense. That's how uh, you're serving one another. And this, this is how Jesus has set this up. And we're to serve all, uh, all places and all opportunities. We serve, you see, in the church. We serve in our community. We serve in the workplace where we, where we work. We serve in the marketplace where we go and, and buy and sell goods. We serve in our homes. We, we serve right in our neighborhoods. We serve where there's an opportunity. And when we do that... The Bible says we'll be a blessing to others and be blessed ourselves. If you know these things, happy. That word happy means uh, uh, satisfied, fulfilled, blessed are you if you do them. So service is the process of meeting needs, isn't it? Take out that little form that I gave you there. Just It's a little sheet that I, I threw together. 25 ways we can serve God. I want to make this very practical for you, okay? 25 ways that we can serve God, and then I'm going to ask you to give me a few more. Because this list is not exhaustive, okay? Uh, it, it's giving of your time, your talents, and your treasures. You've heard that. So uh, just, we can just go down that real quickly. 25 ways you can teach a class or a Bible study. Did you know you can start a Bible study in your own home? You can start one at work, maybe, with, with other people. You can be, you can greet others when they come to church. Be a greeter. You can visit the sick in the hospital. Now I know you can't do that right now very much, but uh, uh, you can send cards or letters. You can cook for someone with a need. You can provide transportation to church for those who need a ride. You can clean, and we have, by the way, we have servants in our church. Thank God, God for that. Amen. Amen. And, and others, and, and many of you are doing these things already. We we can encourage widows, and maybe maybe uh, if you know a woman that that uh, has lived by herself and. Uh, uh, need some help with the maintenance around her house or something, you can encourage her that way, perhaps. You can do lawn care for people. You can lead someone to Christ, can't you? Uh -huh. You can give out a gospel tract. You can start a prayer ministry. You can volunteer at the audio video, video ministry. You can be an usher. You can work in the nursery. You can drive the church van. You can be a kitchen helper. You can be generous to the poor and needy. You can set up for events. You can make, do maintenance around the church. Invite others to church. Share your talents, like, like singing or playing an instrument or... or uh, Things like that. You can serve that way. Uh, you can support missionaries. You can adopt an orphan. You can serve on a committee. What else can we do? What do we leave off the list? Pray for one another. You can pray. Okay, yeah. Pray for one another. We're supposed to do that. Hmm. What else could you do? Clean up what needs to be done. <laughs> Wash the church van. Wash the church fan, okay? Maybe that's, yeah. that's, it's that's a great a team's one. Job, yeah. uh, uh, power wash the building. Power wash, wash the building. Yeah, there we go. Right. Visit uh, nursing homes. Yeah, visit nursing homes. Right. Uh, when we can, right? Again. Uh, visit absentees that uh, someone you notice has been here for a while. You can can email class members or or call them. You can uh, uh, mentor a young person. Vacation Bible Church. School. You can work in vacation Bible school. All kinds of things we can do, can't we? Uh, now, now listen, down at the bottom, notice it says it's possible to be a member of a church but never be part of the team that makes the church function properly. Is that possible? Yeah. Be a member and not ever serve? Yeah. Possible, but it should never happen. Amen? Yeah. You need to be serving. You need to find a place for God. Listen, I want you to be established in the faith. And one of the ways to get established, one of the ways to, to build your faith and do what God would have you to do is find a place of service. I was so excited when I was about when I was 16 years old, and my pastor came to me and said, Carsey, I want you to teach a Sunday school class. Scared me to death, Peter. And first grade boys. Uh, you know, now before that, before
before that, I had been serving. I'd served, you know, I'd sung in the choir. Some would say, sing in the choir if you service, right? Well, you know, something you do. But, but boy, when I started doing that, uh, I didn't know those Bible stories myself, so I really had to study them to figure them out before I tried to teach those first graders, you know, uh, when I was 16. I'd only been to church less than a year. And, but when you begin to serve, guess what happens? You begin to grow and flourish. Pray together. Where are you serving? Ask yourself, where am I serving right now? Where is God using me? What what could I be doing that I'm not doing now? Now, now can I tell you, listen, you're you are not to do everything on that list. Yeah. That's right. Alright? That's not your you, you don't have to do everything on that list. But pick out one thing, two things, maybe three things you can do. And say, God, give me an area of service where I can I can feel like I and, and I can, I'm accomplishing something for you and for your kingdom. And listen, let me tell you something. God's promise to bless you if you do it. Amen? Father, thank you for this opportunity to share your word with your people today. And see the great example of our Savior Jesus. Knowing who he was. Knowing he's about to go back to the Father. Knowing he's the King of kings and Lord of lords. He's on his knees serving God, may it might be just a menial task that we do for someone else. Or it might be something that's that's in front of the in front of the whole church at times or whatever. Or it doesn't matter whether it's unseen or seen. Would you see each act of service, each thought of service, each follow through of service? God, you see that. And I believe you acknowledge it. I believe you bless us with it. The Lord help us to find our place of service. Stand, please. Lord, lead us in songs.